with well over 100 victories under its belt, the 935 enters its fourth year of racing dominance. But at the end of last season, the car's original manufacturer, Porsche, officially announced that they were abandoning the 935 project, leaving a huge void for the numerous race teams hoping to acquire updated versions of the indomitable race car. And with no new versions of the 935 available since 1977, demand was high. Kremer Racing would once again step up to provide a brand new version of the 935, and their latest creation would not disappoint. Oh, and real quick, if you're enjoying this video, or you just like learning about Porsches, click here to subscribe. The new car would be based on previous versions of the 935, and it would be the most extreme non-factory 935 to date. The modifications began with the chassis being extended and strengthened, and the gearbox being installed upside down, which improved the center of gravity and allowed the car to be lowered an additional 4 centimeters. Repositioning the gearbox would also have the added advantage of reduced maintenance time, as the gears could now be replaced without removing the engine. Porsche's water-to-air intercooling system was replaced with an air-to-air -air system, which kept the engine cooler for longer periods of time and helped to maintain more consistent power levels. The engine was bored and stroked to 3.2 liters, and customers had the option of single or twin KKK turbochargers. At maximum boost, the modified motor could generate 800 horsepower. The carbon Kevlar body received a complete aerodynamic overhaul, including a seamless one-piece front end that featured a blended splitter, extractor vents located in front of the hood, and raised air vanes running along the edges of the fenders that direct the flow of air towards the intakes in the rear fenders. The enormous side skirts now angle out, widening the car's footprint, and an additional horizontal lip was added to the bottom for better airflow. Much of the rear fenders were carried over from the K2, with the exception of the single large intake being replaced by two smaller intakes and two large gurney flaps being added at the rear to square off the protruding air vanes and bring back some of the downforce that is lost from the air vanes redirecting the airflow. But the most obvious change to the new 935 is the huge adjustable rear wing that was relocated outboard of the rear bumper and held in place with enormous horizontal supports that blend into the roof line. This helps to control drag and airflow separation, all while generating greater downforce on the rear wheels. The raised deck lid also provides additional room for Kremer's new air-to-air -air intercooler. The new 935 had a top speed of 210 miles per hour and weighed just over 2,200 pounds, and it was called the K3. With its striking and exaggerated proportions, the K3 was an instant fan favorite. But it also had the performance and the durability to back up its aggressive appearance. Now I want to take a quick second to tell you about today's video sponsor, which is my company, Arc Driver Automotive Photography. I specialize in automotive portraits and photos for sales listings. So if you need professional pictures of your car, check out my website, which is linked in the description below. On its maiden race, Klaus Ludwig and the very first K3 dominated a field of 935s, and his winning streak would continue throughout the season. Klaus and his K3 also set a Nürburgring lap record of 7.3 seconds. And by the end of 1979, this 935 didn't just dominate the race season, it would also become one of the most notorious race cars ever built. The K3 would also be crucial to the success of many top racing teams, such as Dick Barber, Jello Team, ASA Kachia, and Interscope. In total, 
Kremer built 13 turnkey race cars and offered a kit that allowed other race teams to update their 935s to K3 specification. Oh yeah, and they also shoot flames. The K3 wouldn't be the only new 935 for the 1979 season because for the first time in four years, a new company would come along to challenge Kremer. Driver Reinhold Yost started his own racing team, Yost Racing, in 1978, and he was looking to make his 935-77As more potent for the 1979 season. Yost knew that Porsche had a surplus of 935-20 baby parts, as that car was retired after only two races, and he was hoping to use his close relationship with Porsche to obtain some of the surplus parts. Yost's plan was successful, and he went to work modifying his existing 935s. He was well aware of the 935 baby's shortcomings, and he wanted his new cars to be more durable and competitive. To reduce engine problems, Yost installed an air-to-air -air intercooler from a Porsche 908, and then bored the engine out to 3.2 liters and installed twin KKK turbochargers. The reworked engine produced 675 horsepower. Although the Porsche's baby bodywork was carefully sculpted to achieve the greatest possible downforce without increasing drag, Yost saw room for improvement. At the front of the car, he replaced the integrated rearview mirrors with air vanes that channeled air all the way back to the intercooler intakes in the C pillars, and he added a deeper front splitter. He also raised the headlamps and extended the indentations in the sides of the bumper cover. To help with cooling, an additional set of intake openings were added to the rear fenders. But the most significant upgrades would be made at the rear of the car, where a custom tubular space frame was created to stiffen and extend the rear fenders and provide better mounting points for the suspension. The tail would also be widened and complemented with enormous gurney flaps that ran along the edges of the fenders, and the rear of the car would be finished off with a larger and more articulated wing that featured an integrated NACA duct. Yost's new creation would be called the 935J. The 1979 season would also feature another unique 935, a mysterious car known only as Chassis 930-990-0031. The car is believed by some to be a 935-77 works that was built by the Porsche factory in 1979 and others believe this is a 935-77A that was rebuilt and customized by the Interscope Racing Team. Regardless, chassis 930-990-0031 participated in just one race, Le Mans, where it suffered engine problems and retired after 154 laps. Im Training hatte Rolf Stommelen Nine Nineteen seventy nine would prove to be yet another incredible year for the nine thirty five, with more than sixty five overall wins, including Sebring, Daytona, Mugello, Hockenheim, Road Atlanta, Nurburgring, Laguna Seca, Lime Rock, Watkins Glen the World Sports Car Championship, and the German Racing Championship. But the 935's biggest victory by far would take place on June 10th of 1979 at the 47th running of the 24 Hours of Le Mans. The 24 Hours of Le Mans is to sport what the Commedia dell'arte is to the theater. The theme and the rules of the game are known. 
but the intrigue and the developments are unpredictable. And in this respect, the 47th edition of the 24 Hours of Le Mans remains one of the most singular, the most surprising. The previous winners, Renault Alpine, would not be returning for the 1979 race, but the 935 had plenty of competition from the newer and more advanced GTP class prototypes, such as the Rondau M379 that won Le Mans the following year, the Cheetah G601, the Dome Zero RL, the Chevron B36, the TOJ SC206, the Mirage M10, and the car that was favored to win, the Porsche 936. Compared to the GTP prototypes, the production-based 935s had inferior aerodynamics, inferior power, and inferior performance, as they were never meant to win Le Mans. But this year would be very different from any other Le Mans race run before or since. Still two by two, still in the positions assigned to them after the two timed sessions. It's three in the afternoon, minus a few seconds. In a well-established ritual, the director's car heads off to the left, signalling the real start. And it's a start that Volek and behind him Bill Whittington managed to perfection. Early in the race, the 936s began to develop mechanical issues, and shortly after, the Mirage M10s started to suffer as well. One by one, the dominant GTP prototypes began to fall, and the more dependable and battle-tested 935s moved closer to the lead. The two Japanese domes are still in the race, although not for much longer. Around midnight, a heavy rainstorm set in over the track and it would remain for the rest of the race. This would give the road-based 935s an unexpected advantage over the more advanced prototypes. And soon it was clear that the 47th running of Le Mans would belong to the Porsche 935. By morning, the 935 K3 being driven by the Whittington brothers and Klaus Ludwig had a 13 lead lap over the second place 935 being driven by Dick Barber, Rolf Stomlin and film star Paul Newman. But at roughly 11 a.m., the lead 935 suffered a broken drive belt and driver Don Whittington broke down on the Molzan Strait. It took Don nearly an hour and a half to get the car back to the pits, and by the time the K3 was repaired and back in the race, their lead was reduced to four laps. But shortly after, the second place team had their own mechanical problems, when a faulty wheel nut took nearly a half hour to remove, and once back on the track, the engine began to misfire and the car was unable to maintain high speeds. 
When the checkered flag was dropped, Porsche 935s came in first, second, and third. In fact, nine of the top 15 cars were Porsche 935s. The Whittington brothers, along with Klaus Ludwig, won Le Mans outright, and they became a worldwide sensation as they were the least experienced drivers to ever win Le Mans and the first drivers to ever win Le Mans in a production-based race car. But what the world didn't know is that the Whittington brothers were funding their entire operation by smuggling cocaine and marijuana and providing airplanes to drug lords, the cartel, and weapons traffickers. They also attempted to defraud the U.S. government out of $20 million, and this was just the beginning of their never-ending crime spree. In fact, the story of the Whittington brothers is so unbelievable that our entire next episode will be devoted solely to them. Thanks for checking out this video, and if you enjoyed it, I've got many more videos documenting Porsche's incredible race history, so click here to subscribe.